Good morning uh, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining our annual IP crammer today. I'm Leighton Cassidy, uh, a partner in the London office and also working out of Dublin. Um, today's event, event is virtual. Uh, this year we had decided to um, not have the event in person as we usually do. Uh, and so our team are here in the London office and thank you all for logging in today. Uh, we're hoping to rejoin and host our regular in-person event next year. Uh, 2021 has been a huge year for, for all of us. We saw uh, the conclusion of the Brexit transition period at the end of 2020 and the UK's departure from the EU coming into practical effect from the start of, the, of 2021. It's hard to believe that it's been five years since the referendum in June uh, 2016. There are likely to be ongoing Brexit issues, as we can see by the current impact of the sausage wars, uh, threats about access to UK's uh, territorial waters <laughs> and fisheries, and the sort of Damocles hanging over the UK's supply and distri distribution network. It's going to be interesting and also of some concern how these and other issues uh, affect the politicians' so-called oven-ready deal and our ongoing relationships with the EU and its member states. The impact of the global COVID pandemic has been significant. We've seen so many people affected and the impact on all of our lives is likely to be ongoing for the foreseeable. Our thoughts are with all and their families tragically affected by the pandemic. COVID-19 has seen the transformation of the way we work. It has presented us all with new challenges in how we interact with the courts, registries, our colleagues and clients. Uh, I would like to think that we have risen to the challenge uh, and for Phil Fisher, 2021 has been a very busy year for our leading IP practice, the firm, its international offices, and our amazing clients. It's fantastic to see people back uh, in the offices again, and we can see the cafes, restaurants, and pubs in the cities starting to get busier. So I'm optimistic about the future. Uh, today, we have a number of excellent talks from uh, our speakers. Uh, our speakers will be taking a look at how the post-Brexit landscape is shaping up for copyright designs and trademarks, and what's on the horizon. We will also delve into the latest news on topical IP issues currently facing businesses. Our speakers today are John Lineker, Natasha Rao, Amy Reynolds, Miriam Boston, Chris Benson, Jude Anthony, and myself. Uh, but before we hand over to the speakers, I just wanted to run through uh, a few housekeeping matters. If you do have any questions, please use the question box in your control panel. Uh, it should be on the right hand side. We will aim to get through as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations, but if we don't get time, we will answer all of the mm -hmm. questions and we'll follow up individually. Uh, if you do have any technical issues, please use your questions drop down and someone from our AV team will uh, be able to assist you as well. Uh, there are no planned fire trails today, hopefully, and the slides will be sent out to you. So if you prefer, uh, you can listen without taking notes. So without further ado, let's crack on. Uh, and I will hand you over to John and Natasha, who are talking about Sky and Skykick, uh, bad faith as the UK law diverging from Europe. Thanks, John. Thank you, Leighton, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Lineker. I'm a partner in the Phil Fisher IP and TPE group. Uh, I'm going to give a presentation on the law of bad faith uh, with my colleague, Natasha Rao, who uh, is an associate in our group. So the area of trademark, that we're in, trademark law that we're in is bad faith, and in broad terms, if a trademark is either applied for or registered in circumstances where there is bad faith, and we'll talk a little bit about what bad faith is, it can be invalidated if it's already on the register, or it can be blocked from ever coming on to the register if it's an application. So that's the area of trademark law we're in. In what circumstances will bad faith taint a mark? to the extent that it becomes invalid. Before we dip into the law, I think it's helpful just to make some general observations about the UK 
uh, an EU trademark system. Basically, the registration regime is title by registration. So you acquire a registered trademark by applying to register it and getting it. And there are very few actual controls around what form that trademark application can take. So, for example, um, there are no rules that will limit the number of terms that you have in your trademarks uh, specification. There are no rules that will uh, allow you or prevent you from registering a very wide term. And so you'll see that in circumstance, it could be argued because you're designing your own trademark and acquiring uh, the, the title by registering it, that in some circumstances, it can be open to abuse. There are no rules also uh, in relation to um, revocation of trademarks after five years non-use. So for example, um, as you know, if a trademark hasn't been used for the first five years of its life, it then becomes vulnerable to non-use revocation. But there are no rules that will actually stop you on the fifth anniversary of the mark, refiling that trademark and resetting the clock for a further five-year non-use period during which the mark cannot be attacked for non-use. So because it's a design your own trademark system broadly, um, some of these circumstances allow, on one view, the trademark system to be abused. And uh, recent case law has deployed the law of bad faith to try and curb some of these uh, practices. So the law of bad faith broadly is in section three and section 47 of the Trademarks Act. And basically it says a trademark won't be registered if or to the extent that the application is made in bad faith. It doesn't actually go on to list in any detail what bad faith means. So it doesn't say, for example, you cannot file very wide trademarks. And if you do, that's bad faith. It doesn't say you can't file general terms like computer software or that will it be in bad faith. It doesn't say it's unlawful and bad faith to evergreen a mark and reapply for it after five years. That has been left to the courts and uh, applicants and litigants in the trademark system to determine. But the law of bad faith has been deployed to cut down or certainly set out some rules about these so-called misuses of the trademark system. Uh, we're going to go on to talk about some specific cases which have put a little bit of flesh on the bone about actually what bad faith means. So we're first going to have a look at a case called Lint, which is the classic bad faith of someone basically using a trademark to block the application or registration of someone else's trademark, knowing and premeditated way that that is going to happen. Yeah. We're going to talk about a case called Coton, which again is a classic bad faith of mark stealing, in effect, taking someone else's trademark and registering it uh, without the permission of the original owner. Thirdly, we're going to look at a case called Hasbro, which lays down some rules about evergreening, which is reapplying for a mark after five years. And that case sets out some law around that. And then finally, we're going to make some observations about the case of Sky v Skykick. And I should declare a, an interest here. The firm is acting for Skykick in that case. So we'll try not to be too partisan in our explanation of that case. But that case covers one of the defects I just mentioned. Is it lawful to file for very long trademark specifications containing 8,000 terms and also containing very broad terms like computer software. What have the courts said about that practice and how has the law of bad faith been 
deployed uh, to try and curb that. So I'm going to hand over to Natasha now, who is going to talk a little bit uh, more detail in a little bit more detail about those four cases. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to cancer quite quickly, I think, uh, through some of the jurisprudence on um, on bad faith, uh, starting with, uh, as John said, the Lint case, uh, which is sort of known as the traditional bad faith case uh, and effectively sort of set the law in this area for a number of years. Um, this was a decision by, made by the CJU back in 2009 um, and uh, effectively surrounded mm. the uh, application by Lint for a community trademark, known now obviously as an EUTM. Uh, for the 3D bunny shape uh, covered in gold foil for chocolate, as I'm sure many of you um, are very familiar with. Um, effectively, uh, the, the issues that were in this case were around the fact that Lint actually knew that there were a number of uh, pre-existing chocolate manufacturers, you know, chocolatiers, who did make chocolate bunnies in, in the same way and, um, you know, in this 3D bunny shape. Uh, and because of that fact finding, uh, and this case made its way up to the CJU, uh, effectively, because of that fact finding, the CJU found, you know, formulated the, this sort of traditional um, test for what's known as for bad faith, namely where the applicant knows that a third party is actually using that sign or a similar sign in relation to an identical or similar product, and where there's you can infer an intention on the applicant's behalf that they actually wanted to prevent a, another party from continuing to use that sign. Uh, it, it could be those could be relevant indicia of, in fact, of there being bad faith, um, as there was found in that case. Uh, and that sort of remained the jurisprudence for a number of years uh, and sort of remained the law um, until a little bit later. Uh, more recently, we've had the Coton case, uh, which was a decision handed down by the CJU uh, in September 2019, uh, which was also another case of this sort of traditional bad faith uh, where you're trying to sort of block a third party from being able to continue to use their sign. Uh, in this case, the sort of uh, key point was around the fact that uh, Mr. Esteban had applied for a mark in um, certain classes, um, 25, 35 and 39, uh, despite knowing of an, a pre-existing um, third party's mark, which was registered in classes 25 and 35. Um, and the sort of point that was an issue in this case was around whether or not it was relevant that uh, he knew of a mark that uh, pre-existed, but only in relation to some of the services for which he wanted to apply for his mark. So there wasn't a complete overlap there between uh, the mark that he wanted to register and the pre-existing mark. Uh, and originally the general court did find that there was no bad faith because uh, the mark that he was looking to register um, was in relation to services that were dissimilar to the pre-existing mark. But actually then that was uh, reversed by the CJU. Uh, they found that effectively it, it shouldn't be a, um, a sort of block to being able to find bad faith that the, um, <clears throat> there's no complete overlap of the pre-existing mark and uh, the mark that's being uh, sought to be registered. Um, and basically try to emphasize that anything that, you know, in any situation where somebody's applying for a trademark with the sole aim of sort of preventing someone else from um, applying for their mark, uh, trademark spotting is what it's called um, in, in the industry, uh, that, that's not acceptable and that that um, needs to be um, precluded by the bad faith provisions. Uh, so that's all sort of the traditional bad faith blocking type cases. Um, but as John was saying, the interesting fact is that more recently, uh, in the last, really in the last year or so, we've been seeing some jurisprudence which extends that bad faith provision to cases uh, that are slightly dissimilar. Um, the first kind of case is uh, in what's known as evergreening type cases. Uh, as John said, effectively, these are, these are situations where uh, because of, there's a non-use revocation, a period in which, a period of five years in which uh, you cannot challenge the mark for non-use. Um, it's, it's basically a practice that has developed to some extent in the industry where uh, a party who has a trademark uh, reapplies for that same trademark or reapplies for that trademark in respect of some of the same goods and services as a previous mark, um, but within that five-year period or just at the end of it to allow them to sort of continue to uh, not have to prove use over time. Um, and the test case for this was the Hasbro case, which um, was only decided by the CJU uh, in July of 2020, um, where effectively Hasbro had a number of registrations for the word monopoly, um, I think from 98, 2009 and 2010. Um, and a third party filed an invalidity action in respect of their later registration, saying that they were trying to circumvent the obligation to prove genuine use by making this repeat filing. 
um, and Hasbro obviously made a number of arguments in front of the CJU, uh, including the fact that, in a, in a way, they didn't they didn't feel that they needed to um, prove that use because it was obvious that there was use of the monopoly mark in respect of games, um, and also because they uh, they felt that you know that they wanted to make the point that this strategy of refiling was very common within the actual in, within the industry. Um, but what was interesting was that the TJU found that that wasn't relevant, that it didn't matter that um, they were able to prove use across some of the goods and services. Um, there was still some, for, you know, they'd registered uh, or attempted to register for which the trademark, there, there was no known use. And also, uh, interestingly, the CJU said that the fact that it was common mm -hmm. practice within the industry uh, wasn't actually relevant to whether or not there was bad faith. So that was quite an interesting remark from the CJU uh, and, and quite a worrying one in, uh, across the industry because obviously when, when something is standard practice, you, you'd largely think that's something that you can do. So that's one kind of case, and uh, that case uh, was a that was a sorry that was a general court decision, and that has been appealed up to the CJU. Um, so we will see what happens there, but obviously watch that watch the space. Uh, the last case I'm going to talk about very briefly is the Sky Sky and Sky Pit case. Um, uh, that's quite a complicated case with a lot of uh, relevant facts, but what we're looking at here is uh, particularly uh, use um, across the breadth of the trademark. Uh, Sky has a number of trademarks which are asserted against uh, a party called Skykick, um, where their trademarks included thousands of goods and services, uh, including those where uh, it was found uh, by the first instance judge that there was no intention to use, such as fire extinguishers, uh, Gladstone bags, things like that. But also um, they had registered their marks in respect to terms where they couldn't have possibly intended to use across the breadth of that term, such as computer software. Uh, the CJU set up, uh, you know, this case went up to the CJU and they found, uh, they set out a test uh, as to when lack of intention to use or, or, or what we call, I suppose, overclaiming uh, and can, can actually amount to bad faith. Um, they said that effectively, if there are objective, relevant and consistent indicia um, indicating that the applicant had the intention to undermine the interest of third parties uh, or to mm -hmm. obtain a right uh, for purposes other than those falling within the functions of the trademark, that can amount to bad faith, but in specific circumstances. Um, and what's particularly interesting about this is that uh, when this case came back down to the High Court, um, the High Court judge sort of duly found that there had been bad faith and narrowed uh, a few of Sky's uh, terms in their trademark. Uh, but then Sky did appeal that decision up to the Court of Appeal, who actually reversed the High Court's judgment and found that Sky hadn't acted in bad faith because uh, but by this point, the case was only dealing with these very broad terms, such as computer software. Uh, and uh, the Court of Appeal made the point that uh, it was it's basically not fair to expect the applicant to um, have sort of been using the mark in respect of every conceivable subdivision of that particular term. So it was fine for Sky to be able to prove some use across computer software, but not necessarily across the breadth of that term. Um, which is uh, an interesting point because uh, it shows potentially a, move, a, a movement away from the EU jurisprudence uh, on the UK side uh, and probably possibly indicates that in the future we might see that bad faith is applied uh, as a provision more broadly in the EU but potentially more narrowly in the UK. Uh, but uh, again, we'll need to watch this space because um, Skykick has actually appealed this decision up to the Supreme Court, which uh, John is going to very briefly talk to you about now. I'll hand over back to John. Thanks, Natasha. Just to conclude on Sky v Skykick, um, Skykick have made an application for leave to appeal the Court of Appeals decision to the Supreme Court. And the current situation is that we're waiting for a decision on that leave application. Uh, obviously, as we're acting for Skykick, we are hopeful that the Supreme Court will take the case. Um, looking at it in the round, there's quite an interesting situation currently about the law of bad faith, particularly in the Skykick context of lack of intention to use, because we have the first instance decision of Lord Justice, Ar uh, Lord Justice Arnold sitting as a High Court judge, basically finding that the conduct of Sky amounted to bad faith. Uh, and finding it to be unlawful to maintain a registration as wide as computer software. Uh, yet we have the Court of Appeal basically giving the diametrically opposite decision and saying it's fine to have uh, a term as wide as computer software, 
as long as you're using it in a little corner of that term, for example, computer software set top boxes, which is what SkyKit do. So there appears to be a diametrically opposite view uh, of the law of bad faith. And as I say, we're hopeful that the case will be taken by the Supreme Court and that at last we'll have some finality and clarity on bad faith. Thank you for listening. I am now going to hand over to Amy Reynolds, who's going to talk about trademark winners and losers in recent case law. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John and Natasha. Good morning, everyone. My name's Amy Reynolds, and I'm going to spend the next 10 or so minutes running through some interesting trademark cases from the past year. So first of all, I'm going to talk about sound trademarks. As you may know, it has been possible to register sound trademarks as EU trademarks since October 2017. Applications for sound marks have to be submitted in an audio format, reproducing the sound or by an accurate representation of the sound in musical notation. The case that I'm going to talk about, Ardar Metal Beverage Holdings versus the EU IPO, was the European General Court's first judgment relating to sound trademarks. So in this case, the German company Ardar Metal Beverage Holdings filed an EU TM application back in 2018, and it was in classes 6, 29, 30, 32, and 33. It submitted a sound file for a sound described as a drinks can being opened, followed by a silence of approximately one second, and a fizzing sound lasting approximately nine seconds. And the goods covered were various drinks and metal containers. So my colleague Billy's now going to try and play the uh, audio for you. The court also found that the relevant public would associate the sound of fizzing bubbles with drinks in general and would not distinguish it from similar sounds in the drinks field, so this sound was therefore not distinctive. Okay, so continuing with the non-traditional trademarks theme, I'm now going to talk on about two cases about shape trademarks and in particular shape trademarks in the cosmetics and skincare industry. So in the first case, French skincare brand EOS products applied to the EU IPO to register a 3D sign. The sign consisted of a white spherical or ovoid shaped object, um, depending on the point of view, uh, with a smooth surface, a flattened bottom, a recessed notch on one side and a horizontal dividing line in the middle. You can see the sign in the top image on this slide. And the application for the sign covered a range of goods, including cosmetics, lip balms and applicators. The General Court reiterated that novelty or originality are not relevant criteria for the assessment of the distinctive character of a trademark, so that for a mark to be registered, it's not sufficient that it is original. It also has to be substantially different from the basic forms of the product in question <coughs> that are commonly used in the trade. In the cosmetic sector, packaging with varied shapes, including round or spherical containers, is common, and therefore the General Court held that the shape represented in the mark was not significantly different from the standard shapes in that sector. In addition, the court found that the characteristics um, of the sign, so that the things that I described earlier, the flattened bottom, the horizontal line and the recessed notch, um, do not stand out in the overall perception, but instead merge with the shape's fun functional characteristics um, so that they do not uh, give the sign distinctive character. Um, and then in contrast to this, the um, Guerlain case is a really good example of a shape trademark, which is in fact registrable. 
So the shape in question is a lipstick case, and you can see that on the um, second image on your slide. In this case, the court found that the shape is uncommon for a lipstick and differs from other shapes existing on the market. Um, and the court said that the shape in question is reminiscent of a boat hull or a baby carriage. Um, and in addition, the fact that the lipstick cannot be placed upright reinforces the uncommon visual aspect of the shape. So the general court considered that the relevant public would be surprised by the shape and therefore the mark applied for has distinctive character and is capable of registration as a trademark. Okay, so sports brand Puma has had a bit of a run of bad luck um, in the last year, and I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on two cases. In the first case against Nike, the English High Court upheld the UK IPO's decision to register Nike's application for the word footwear, spelt F-O-O-T-W-A-R-E, for various goods and services in classes 9, 38 and 42, and these included software and hardware. Siding with Nike, Justice Seccaroli held that footwear is not an ordinary descriptive term for the goods and services or customary in the relevant trade. Puma argued that Nike's footwear mark would simply be seen as a misspelling of the usual spelling of footwear, which would be descriptive in relation to software, hardware, etc., for use in relation to footwear with embedded technology. But the court said that they do not see how this point takes Puma's case any further, because even if the spelling of the mistake is corrected, the word footwear is still not descriptive of any of the relevant goods or services. The second case was a dispute about a looping cap device used by a third party. Um, an Italian machinery manufacturer called Gemma Group applied to register an EU trademark for the logo on the left of the slide in relation to machines for processing of wood and aluminium and machines for treatment of PVC in class seven. Puma opposed the application on the basis of article 8.5 arguing that the trademark applied for was identical with or similar to Puma's earlier trademarks, um, which are on the right on the slide, um, which had a reputation. And Puma's opposition ultimately failed for the following reasons. The goods covered by the mark applied for were aimed at industry specialists and professionals. Puma's earlier marks were aimed at the general public. So the relevant public for the goods covered by each of the marks at issue were, were different. Um, there was only seen to be a certain degree of visual similarity between the marks. Um, and although Puma's marks had a substantial to very substantial reputation in relation to clothing and related goods, the reputation was not thought to be exceptional. Puma did not show that the relevant public would establish a link between the marks due to the differences between the marks, the differences between the goods covered by those marks, and the substantial but not exceptional reputation that Puma enjoyed and the differences between the public targeted by, by the respective marks. So Puma ultimately had not done enough to show that there was a real risk of detriment here and why use of a somewhat similar mark for specialist industrial machinery would adversely affect Puma's own reputation for athletic clothing or the distinctive character of Puma's marks. Okay, now let's talk about neologisms. A neologism is a newly coined word and in the Wirex case, the Intellectual Property Court, or IPEC, mm -hmm. considered whether the trademark CryptoBack was invalid in relation to financial and software services. In particular, Judge Hakon considered whether a neologism could be descriptive despite being an invented word and whether sufficient goodwill was owned in that neologism to support a trademark invalidity claim. So just to give you a bit of background, um, Wirex launched a credit card reward scheme under which rewards were paid to customers back in Bitcoin. Wirex called the scheme CryptoBack and registered the trademark in the UK in relation to financial and software services. Crypto Carbon Global and its associates also offered a cryptocurrency cashback service using the word CryptoBack. Wirex commenced proceedings for trademark infringement and the defendants counterclaimed that Wirex's trademark was invalidly registered and that Wirex had committed passing off. So the crypto back trademark is a newly coined word and in this case it's created by combining and contracting two existing words so firstly cryptocurrency and secondly cashback. Um, Judge Hakon acknowledged that there was a, uh, a potential difficulty facing a business seeking to rely on goodwill associated with a newly coined word such as this um, when it's used in relation to a particular product or service because such a word might be understood by the public to be a new word for that type of product or service rather than an um, indication of origin in, in the trademark sense. 
Um, and a related question is whether the public would consider such a word descriptive of the services being offered under it. So in this case, the crypto back trademark was considered to be sufficiently distinctive and non-descriptive to function as a trademark. In addition, Judge Hakon found that the defendant's evidence regarding prior use and goodwill in the crypto back name was actually unreliable, um, mainly because of inconsistencies and lack of evidence to support some of the claims that they made in their witness statements. So the allegation of invalidity was therefore failed, and it followed that the YRX's um, trademark had been infringed by the defendants. Okay, the last case that I'm going to speak about today is um, Swatch versus Apple. Um, Apple successfully opposed the UK trademark applications filed by watchmaker Swatch um, for Swatch One More Thing and One More Thing. The opposition was based on Apple's earlier goodwill in the phrase One More Thing, which, is often has, which has often been used in the past by Steve Jobs at its product launches. The English High Court has allowed an appeal by Swatch, so watch this space. Okay, thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand over to Miriam Bofton, who's going to um, give you an update on copyright in the post-Brexit world. Thanks, Amy. As mentioned, I'm now going to briefly cover a few updates in the world of copyright. So a lot has happened this year in the world of copyright, from the implementation date of the Copyright Directive to further case law looking at communication to the public. This mostly builds on topics that I've covered in previous years, so I'm going to try and avoid repetition and focus on the, really the latest developments. If anyone wants any further background or history on any of these matters, please do contact me separately. So first, the Copyright Directive. As a quick reminder, the Copyright Directive aims to adapt and supplement existing copyright rules to ensure they are fit for the modern digital age. As a result of Brexit, the UK will not be implementing the Copyright Directive, so it does mean that once it's implemented in member states, copyright law will diverge. However, it's still going to be really relevant to those trading between the UK and the EU. In terms of where we've got to with implementation in member states, I've put up on this slide here the status in each country. Um, as you can see, only a few have actually fully implemented so far. As a result of that, in July this year, the Commission began legal action against 23 member states for failing to implement the directive into their national laws. Member states then had two months to respond and take necessary measures, um, and then the Commission may decide to issue reasoned opinions and take further measure. So as a result of this, we might see a lot more progress from various countries in implementation. However, there are various reasons why there might have been delays in implementation so far. There could be general delays caused by things like Brexit and COVID, but there are also specific factors that relate to delays with implementing the directive itself. So one factor that can cause delays is the provision of guidance on Article 17. So as a reminder on what Article 17 is, it was supposed to address the so-called value gap that was identified initially in the music industry who criticised online platforms such as YouTube and Facebook for making huge profits by selling advertisements alongside copyright content that were uploaded by users, all without adequately rewarding copyright owners. Under Article 17, these platforms are deemed to be communicating to the public themselves the content uploaded by the users and therefore will be directly liable for any uploads that infringe copyright. Under the directive, the Commission was meant to organise stakeholder dialogue meetings to work out how Article 17 would actually operate in practice to ensure a proper balance of all the competing interests. Following those meetings and a public consultation, they did publish guidance, but that wasn't until the 4th of June this year. And the implementation date for the directive was the 7th of June this year. So that didn't really leave much time for member states to consider that uh, guidance as part of implementing the directive. In terms of what the actual guidance covered, effectively it protects users' interests by stating that only manifestly infringing content is blocked at source and other content can go up but will be reviewed by a human after it's been posted if a rights holder isn't happy with its publication. However, there is an exception to this rule. The guidance has introduced the ability for rights holders to earmark content, the use of which they claim could cause them significant economic harm. The guidance sets out a, a procedure with mechanisms to review and appeal decisions on that, but essentially there is a concern that this could be used to override copyright exceptions. The guidance seems to state that uses that are covered by an exception but relate to content which has been earmarked by rights holders could still be blocked at source. As I mentioned, there's quite a complicated mechanism in terms of the review process and appealing decisions. So I've set that out um, on this slide if you want to have a look at it in your own time. 
So in terms of the status of the guidance that's been provided, it's not actually legally binding in itself, but commentators do describe it as soft law. Based on settled case law, the guidance won't confer rights on individuals themselves, which they can rely on before national courts and authorities. However, those national courts can take it into consideration when deciding disputes before them. Another factor might, which might have caused delay in implementing the Copyright Directive could be the pending challenge from Poland. So Poland's actually issued legal proceedings asking the CJAU to annul parts of Article 17 of the Directive, which they argue infringe the right to freedom of expression and information guaranteed by Article 11 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. The Advocate General delayed giving his opinion on the validity of Article 17, which was originally due in April, until after the guidance had been provided. So the opinion itself wasn't handed down until July this year, and the ruling is going to follow either later this year uh, or early next year. So Poland could still be a way off implementation. According to the opinion itself, um, the Advocate General considered that the preventative measures to monitor and block user uploads that was envisioned by Article 17 did constitute a limitation on the exercise of the right to freedom of expression and information. However, that limitation was compatible with Article 11 because it respects the proportionality requirement and there are sufficient safeguards already built in. So I'm now going to move on to some of the CJAU case law on the subject of communication to the public. First, I'm going to look at the joint cases in YouTube and Cyando. We've covered those in previous crammers, so, but they're about the liability of online platform operators in relation to the copyright and protected works that are illegally posted on those platforms by users. While the referrals were not about Article 17, the relationship between Article 3 of the InfoSoc Directive and Article 17 and the Safe Harbour Defence are obviously intertwined. In the YouTube and Cyando ruling, in one paragraph that I've put on the slide here, the court does refer to the Copyright Directive and states that the questions referred do not concern the set of rules established by the new Copyright Directive because that came into force subsequently. This confirms that Article 17 does not clarify the existing law for platform liability but is a novel and different regime with no retroactive application. In this decision, confusingly with regard to communication to the public, unlike under Article 17, the CJU has said that under Article 3 of the Infrastructure Directive, operators of online platforms do not in principle themselves make a communication to the public of copyright protected content that's illegally posted online by users of those platforms. However, operators do make such a communication <coughs> in breach of copyright if they actually contribute beyond merely, merely making those platforms available. So this could be in circumstances such as if the operator has specific knowledge that the protected content is available illegally and they refrain from expeditiously deleting or blocking the content or refrain from putting in place appropriate technical measures to deal with it or it could be if the operator participates in selecting protected content that's illegally communicated to the public or if it provides specific tools on the platform that are for illegal sharing. The CJAU in this case also confirmed that such operators may benefit from the state and harbour defence unless they have played an active role so that they have knowledge or control over the content on the platform. So how will these two regimes interact with one another, with one regime more lenient to service providers than the other? We need to see how this will play out because presumably while the platforms are issuing these proceedings, YouTube and Cyando's uploaded platform would be liable under Article 17 if they didn't have a license. The same is not true uh, under Article 3 alone according to this ruling. So as the law continues to develop in this area and discussions surrounding the proposed Digital Services Act are ongoing, which sets out yet another regime for the liability of service providers, It'll be interesting to see how they impact, see what impact they have on cases like these in the future. The next CJU case I want to briefly consider is that of BJ Build. So the facts are on this slide, but essentially the German court asked the CJU for guidance on when embedding and linking would fall within communication to the public. This is the first CJU case on this subject post Brexit, which means that the UK is not bound by it, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. I put a key quote from the judgment on this slide here, but it's a little bit complicated and long-winded, so I'm going to break it down in the next slide. So first, the CJAU warned that authorising one communication should not exhaust the right to authorise or prohibit other communications of the same work. The CJAU summarised the position from Svensson and other key cases on communication to the public, confirming that framing, whether by a clickable link or an embedded inline link that hid the original site, does constitute a communication. However, if the technical means that are used by the framing technique is the same as the original communication of publishing the work on the internet, this would not be to a new public, so no additional authorization would be required. 
This position, however, only applies where the original publication was not subject to any restrictive measures and is freely accessible. Therefore, in situations such as on these facts, where the grant of a license was subject to the implementation of measures to restrict framing, the rights holder cannot be regarded as having consented to third parties being able to freely communicate work to the public. Where a rights holder has adopted or obliges licensees to adopt restrictive measures against framing to limit access to the work, the act of making the content available on the original website and secondarily making that content available means of framing constitute different communications and therefore each must be authorised individually. So moving on to a case from the UK, um, looking at War the TuneIn case here. So Warner and Sony own or hold the exclusive licences to copyright and sound recordings of music. The defendant, TuneIn, operates an online platform called TuneIn Radio that enables users in the UK easily to access radio stations from around the world which are broadcast on the internet. And this is available via a website and also downloadable mobile apps. TuneIn itself doesn't collect, transmit or store any third party audio content. It connects the users to and therefore relies on the streams from those third party radio stations. The judge therefore referred to this as a type of framing because the underlying stream is not visible to the end user of TuneIn. The claimants argued that TuneIn had infringed their UK copyright by communicating the sound recordings to the public, or alternatively that TuneIn had authorised or was jointly liable for the commission of that restricted act by the operators of the foreign radio stations. In the case of stations licensed in the UK, the court concluded that there was no new public addressed by TuneIn's links, since the claimants were treated as having consented to the act of communication to the public in the UK by the radio station. For the remaining categories of station, the court concluded that TuneIn was retargeting that foreign content into the UK by linking to it. As such, that communication was to a new public that was not taken into account by the copyright owner, um, even if the first act was licensed. There was an appeal of this, but on the main issue, the Court of Appeal dismissed TuneIn's appeal in relation to the foreign stations not licensed in the UK. Given that this was decided after Brexit, the court was actually asked to depart from settled CGA UK law, and that's quite an interesting thing to have a little bit more of a look at. So as a reminder, after Brexit, existing CGA UK law up to the 31st of December 2020, including that that I've covered previously on communication to the public and hyperlinking, constitutes retained EU case law, meaning that it continues to form part of domestic law in the UK and to bind lower courts. However, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court have been given the power to depart from such judgments. Subsequent cases after this date are not part of this retained law. So in terms of looking at the question in TuneIn as to how when to depart from CGAU case law, they were asked to do so, but all of the judges declined. Lord Justice set out the basis for departing from CGAU case law was essentially the same as for the Supreme Court to depart from its own settled case law. And the Supreme Court, and before that the House of Lords, frequently emphasised that that should be done with great caution. On this particular issue, there have been no change to the relevant domestic or international legislation since 31st of December 2020. It's also an area where it's already difficult. We cover it in a lot of detail ourselves, and the CJU has unrivaled experience in trying to interpret it. So returning to the drawing board and not taking out those decisions would create great legal uncertainty. Therefore, they looked at what weight should be given to the case of VG Field, which I discussed previously, given that it was handed down in March this year after Brexit. So Arnold, looking at that, said the court could have regard to it actually, um, and found the CJU's judgment was highly persuasive. He said that it followed 24 other cases from the CJU on the subject and was directly relevant to the present case, given that it addressed the relationship between CJU decisions that in the first instance, first had considered to be in conflict with each other. So the court did see this as a really useful case to look at. As a result of this, it seems that um, the UK judges, at least on this complicated subject matter, have no intention of hastening legal divergence between the UK and the EU, and that they consider that any significant change will need to come via legislation. They chose to apply the CJU's ruling where they had no obligation to do so. Therefore, it is really important for us to still continue to monitor CJU or CJ EU case law, both for the impact on the remaining member states, but also because it could still provide guidance on the direction of law that the UK is going to take. There may still also be legislative reforms that are coming, particularly in light of the recent DCMS committee report on music streaming and the UK's government's response. But with Brexit and COVID still causing delays, let's see how and when that's actually going to happen. We'll continue to monitor the position and keep you up to date. I'm now going to hand over to Chris, who's going to talk about exhaustion. 
Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Miriam. So in my session, I'm going to be looking at the future of exhaustion of rights in the UK. And what I'm going to be looking at is parallel trade. So the parallel import into the UK and export from the UK of IP protected goods. So the general pos position is that once goods have been placed on the market in a particular territory by the IP rights holder, the IP rights in those goods are exhausted and the holder cannot prevent any subsequent dealings with them. And the question now for the UK government to consider after Brexit is what is that territory? Should the territory be the UK? Should it be the EU? Should it be the world? The position before Brexit, as I've set out on the slide here, was we had adopted the EU's regional exhaustion regime, sometimes known as Fortress Europe. So goods placed on the market by the IP owner or with his consent within the EEA could be imported into the UK from the EEA and could be exported out of the UK to the EEA without any permissions needed. That was the position before Brexit. And where are we now? Well, post-Brexit, um, we really monitor and it's the same as status quo. So the UK is unilaterally participating in the EEA regional exhaustion system. So it means that IP rights in goods, which have first legitimately been placed on the market in the EEA, are exhausted in the EU, and those goods can be imported into the UK without approaching the rights owner for permission. So, for example, if an IP rights owner sells books in Germany, which are protected by copyright, the copyright is exhausted and those books can be imported into the UK without infringing copyright. On the other hand, however, IP rights in goods which are first placed on the market legitimately in the UK are not exhausted in the EEA and the rights owner can prevent the parallel export from the UK to the EEA. So if, a, for example, is a particular range of cars sold under a registered trademark by an IP owner in the UK, the IP owner can prevent those cars being sold in Italy as their rights have not been exhausted. Anyone wanting to export such products is going to need the permission of the IP rights owner. So as some of you may know, the government issued a consultation paper on this and on the future of the parallel trade system in the UK. This was launched on the 7th of June, 2021 and responses were due by the end of August 2021. Uh, the consultation paper says it covers four particular IP rights, patents, copyright, registered trademarks, and registered designs. There are certain areas where the consultation paper <coughs> does not cover, for example, purely digital goods. So any music or books, for example, which can be downloadable to your device from the internet and not covered by this consultation paper and also counterfeit products are not covered because parallel trade is the trade in legitimate IP related goods. Also the consultation paper stresses that it's only covering parallel imports, imports into the UK, as what happens to export is going to be governed by the laws of the country to which the goods are exported. The consultation paper believe that the sectors particularly affected by parallel trade are fast-moving consumer goods, luxury goods, print and publishing, pharmaceuticals, and the automotive industry. A feasibility study was carried out by the government back in 2018 into the scale and extent of parallel trade, but the consultation paper states that very little data was found and there are gaps in the government's knowledge, and therefore the aim of this consultation paper was to seek evidence and data from the trade. What it then came up with, with four particular four potential options for exhaustion in the future in the UK, unilateral EEA, national, international, and mixed. And I'll go through each of these in turn. So the first one they came up with was the unilateral EEA, which would mean the UK would unilaterally adopt the regional EEA exhaustion system so it's sometimes sometimes been called uk plus so parallel imports from the eea into the uk would automatically be permitted 
assuming that you had separate authorization for any regulated goods such as medicines, but parallel exports could be prohibited. The consultation period does give some benefits um, if we adopt this system. So this would be, they, they believe, be least costly for businesses um, who are reliant on the EEA for raw materials and goods, and they believe there'll be the same level of choice for consumers on the market. The second option is the national option, which would mean that the IP rights and IP related goods would only be exhausted in the UK once those goods have been put on the market in the UK. So this would mean no parallel imports at all from outside the UK, from anywhere, no parallel exports. What it would mean would be the rights holders have greater control over their products and the IP rights would be perceived as stronger. There may be less choice for consumers because there'll be less products on the marketplace. There may be higher prices for consumers as the IP rights holders have greater control. The government's view appears to be that, however, this national exhaustion system doesn't comply with the Northern Ireland Protocol, as under that, parallel goods have to move freely between Ireland and the other EU member states and Northern Ireland, and they do not believe this would comply, and this is stated to have been included for completeness. Our third alternative option is the international system. And this would mean that IP rights are exhausted once they've been put on the market in any country worldwide. So parallel imports would be permitted from any country without permission of the rights owner, assuming again there's separate authorization for regulated goods such as medicines. Parallel exports on the other hand could still be stopped, but the rights owner's rights would be weakened because they couldn't control any dealings that are in these goods when they've been put on the market in any country in the world. The consultation paper believes this could increase consumer choice because there could be more products on the marketplace, could reduce the prices as there'd be more people trying to sell their products. But on the downside, there could be customer confusion because you could have, for example, books on the marketplace which have been sold under different titles in different countries or come into the UK. Or you could have products that have different formulations in different countries, again, on the UK market. They also believe there could be consumer safety issues because there could be different regulatory standards in different countries for products. And our fourth and final option is what is called a mixed exhaustion system, where a specific product sector or right is subject to one regime and all other product sectors or IP rights are subject to a different regime. And the consultation period gives a couple of examples where this has been applied. So, for example, in Switzerland, most goods can be parallel imported except medicines. In Australia, they have had um, parallel import restrictions on books. This could, however, be rather complex. So, for example, if you took a product which mm -hmm. is protected by a trademark and a patent, and if you had an EEA UK plus exhaustion system for patents and an international exhaustion system for trademarks, the, the um, situation could be complicated having to deal with those. Looking quickly at some additional points, what will affect be on licenses? Well, if you have the international exhaustion and the IP rights are regarded as weaker, a licensee may not be as willing to take on a license and um, because you will be faced with parallel imports from around the world. Whereas if there is national exhaustion, a license will be more valuable as a licensee could rely on the fact there'll be no parallel imports. Again, what could be the effect on products made from component parts, such as cars, which are made from various parts, or fashion products, which come from various fabrics from different countries? Easier, again, if there's international exhaustion, more difficult if not. Another period to consider is how long should any implementation period be? Because businesses, of course, have to adapt to these new ways of dealing with their supply chain and distribution. The government has said it doesn't have a preferred option, but it is mindful of the treaties it has entered into. So finally, what next? In the consultation paper, the government recognises this is a difficult and contentious issue. It has received a number of submissions and it is now considering those. It has said it will make a decision and choose the option which, in its words, 
best serves the UK economy, the UK public and the UK as a whole. It sedates it's going to work as quickly as possible to resolve this, but unfortunately we have no indication yet of when, what the next stage will be when they will come up with their recommendations. And it does seem that with the different approaches taken by trade associations, distributors, importers, IP rights owners, there are definitely going to be winners and losers, whichever SEPs um, exhaustion regime we choose. So the question really is, the answer is really watch this space and see what happens next. <clears throat> and with that, I'll hand over to uh, Leighton Casti and Jude Anthony, who are going to examine emerging trends and issues arising from Brexit. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, uh, Jude and I are going to be talking uh, briefly about uh, some of the emerging trends and issues uh, following Brexit. We think that you're all probably aware of this, but uh, EU TMs no longer cover the UK after Brexit. So at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December, uh, the EU TM rights were no longer in effect uh, before uh, the UK. Uh, as part of the withdrawal agreement, the UK created comparable trademark rights, and these were uh, effective and registered as at the 31st of December 2020. Uh, it's important that you capture the EU trademark rights on your database or docket, and if you're a Phil Fisher client, we would have done that for you, but it's important that that is uh, recorded so that you can monitor for uh, docketing and renewal purposes. Uh, there's also a requirement to have a representative of record uh, with the EU IPO representative that would have gone through to the UK uh, registration and there's a three-year grace period for any EU representative to uh, be replaced with a UK representative. So that's key to ensure that you don't miss out on any of the official correspondence from the registry. Uh, for pending uh, EU trademark rights, uh, as at the 31st of December, uh, it's possible to file a UK comparable application, uh, which would then maintain the same priority date as the EU TM. Uh, the deadline for this has now passed. This was the 30th of September uh, of this year. Uh, but don't despair uh, if it has, uh, if it's important for the business to ensure that you have the continuing national protection, it's still possible to file. The only uh, effect of that is that you will not have uh, the priority from the EU trademark right. Uh, there is the ability to opt out of the comparable trademark system. Uh, and if it's unwanted, it's possible to opt out. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's not possible to opt out if you've used the comparable UK right, and this applies if you've assigned or licensed uh, the, the right, entered into an agreement in relation to it, or you've initiated litigation based on it. Uh, surrender is still possible under a separate procedure before the UK IPO, but the effect of the surrender will be that the surrender is effective from the date that the request is filed. And with the opting out procedure, uh, the comparable right will be treated as if it had never been applied for or registered under UK law. Um, I'm gonna talk next about licenses. So licenses recorded against EU TMs uh, were not uh, cloned in the UK comparable rights. Uh, EU-wide licences covering the UK before Brexit will still cover the UK, uh, but the issue is, is that uh, they won't find themselves onto the register where they would have been usually recorded against the registration. Uh, and some of the advisory points in relation to licence agreements uh, that you should be thinking about is that you should notify the licensee of the existence of the comparable trademark uh, and you may amend the license uh, agreement to include the new UK mark. And you should also be registering the license agreement against the comparable right uh, created with the UK IPO. There is a deadline of 12 months, so you've given some grace to do that, and it's coming up towards the end of this year on the 31st of December. Uh, the impact of non-recordal of a license against the registration uh, can be an inability to bring proceedings or to recover costs in those proceedings so it can impact licensees quite significantly. 
Uh, with security interests, the provisions are also uh, similar in relation to licenses. Uh, security interests that were recorded against EUTMs were not cloned in the UK comparable rights. Uh, again, the security uh, will cover the new comparable right, but it won't be recorded. Uh, if it's not recorded, uh, the security interest uh, will not be effective against third parties, and security interests are commonly used by banks or lenders uh, in order to take security over IP assets like trademarks or designs or, or, or patents. Uh, again, there's a similar provision in relation to the recordal of security interests, and again, that's coming up towards the end of this year on the 31st of December. Um, I'm now going to hand you back over to Jude, who's going to take up the rest of the presentation. Uh, thanks, Aidan. Uh, so the another trademark issue um, arising out of Brexit relates to proof of use requirements. So if you have an EUTM and you're only trading in the UK, or you have a new UK comparable right, but you're only trading in the EU, your rights will eventually become vulnerable to challenge on the grounds of non-use. Uh, they'll be vulnerable to challenge on these grounds if they're not used within the relevant jurisdiction for five years. Uh, so use in the UK before 31st of December 2020 still counts as use in the EU and uh, likewise use in the EU but not the UK uh, before that date will still count as use of your new UK comparable right. But the relevance of this use will eventually fade out over time. Uh, so it's therefore worth considering um, extending your use if you're a UK based trader into the rest of the EU or if you're in the EU, then extending it into the UK. Um, Miriam discussed this in relation to copyright, but divergence of the UK from EU substantive trademark law is now possible. Um, EU court decisions from before 31st of December are still binding on the lower courts and tribunals as retained case law, but the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court are not bound and can diverge. Uh, decisions issued after 31st of December 2020 are obviously influential but not binding. Uh, so it's essentially that's the same for trademarks um, and divergence is possible and it's we'd expect something over time but it's too soon to say exactly what will happen. Uh, another uh, complication arising out of Brexit is uh, customs notices which are also known as Applications for Action or AFAs. So um, it's possible to file an AFA uh, with customs in any EU member state and designate the entire EU. Uh, this would authorise customs in each member state to look out for and seize counterfeit products. Um, and obviously these previously covered the UK uh, in an EU-wide AFA, but they no longer do. Um, you can now file national UK AFAs and we can also still file EU AFAs, um, just not with HMRC, they have to be filed with customs in a member state, so generally we would use Ireland for that. Uh, another issue is the availability of pan-EU pan -EU injunctions in UK courts. Uh, so previously these were available um, if you sued for infringement in a UK court, when the UK was a member state, you could get an injunction covering the whole EU. Uh, there is currently some uncertainty as to whether they will still be available in the UK for cases pending as at 31st December 2020. Uh, obviously for cases commenced after that date, they will not be available. Uh, so, the impact of this may be quite limited because there won't be too many cases that it affects. Um, if you do need a pan-European injunction, then um, we would advise to commence proceedings in another jurisdiction if there's damage there. And obviously we have offices throughout the continent, so this is something we could help with. Uh, the next issue I wanted to talk about is design rights, which um, are more complicated than trademarks due to the existence of unregistered design rights. So registered EU designs um, 
called RCDs have been cloned as UK comparable rights uh, in the same way as trademarks. Um, there are also unregistered UK, sorry, EU design rights, UCDs, which the UK has introduced a new unregistered right called supplementary unregistered designs uh, to mirror these. But the existence of unregistered designs depends on first disclosure and disclosures in different territories can conflict with one another. So if you were to disclose your design in the UK, you'd get an SUD, but this may uh, destroy the novelty of the design um, within the EU, so you may no longer be able to get an unregistered community design. Um, there is a possibility of simultaneous disclosure, but this is untested uh, at this point. Uh, and this can be quite important um, for some industries like the fashion industry where um, products are, and designs are introduced sort of internationally at sort of major shows. So the result of this is that um, it appears that registered design rights are becoming more popular. And um, we've already noticed a sort of a large uptick in the number of UK registered design filings uh, since Brexit. Um, to avoid the complications with, with the disclosures. And also it, um, it gives you stronger protection because you don't need to prove copying and a uh, lot more longer lasting protection as well. So the final thing I wanted to talk about is geographical indicators of origin. So these are GIs assign um, used on goods which have a specific geographical origin and possess specific qualities or reputation due to their or origin. So um, as some, some examples, Darjeeling tea, Stilton cheese and, and cognac. These are most commonly used in agricultural products, wines and spirits. Um, these protections have been preserved under the withdrawal agreement in the UK and mirrored in a new UK scheme. So everything that was protected um, under the EU design, um, GI scheme is now protected in the UK. Um, so the new UK scheme, again, it protects food, drink and agricultural products um, and it uses the designations protected, designation of origin or PDO, protected graphical indication, PGI. Um, and the scheme in the UK is now up and running. So in addition to all of the um, GIs protected under the EU scheme, um, you can now file nationally in the UK. And the first registration uh, has been for Welsh Gower Salt Marsh Lamb, uh, which is a PDO. And the lambs that produce this meat must be born, reared and slaughtered on the Gower Salt Marsh. <laughs> which is near Swansea in South Wales. Uh, the lambs graze on the naturally occurring plants on the marsh, such as samphire, sorrel, and sea lavender. And this um, apparently gives the meat a very distinctive flavor. Um, there is no agreement on mutual recognition of future GIs. So this won't necessarily be protected in the EU and likewise new um, European GIs filed after 31st December last year, um, although, Obviously, you could file into the UK or into the EU uh, separately. And with that, I will hand you back over to Leighton. Thank you. Thanks, Jude. Um, yeah, finally, just to, to wrap up the emerging trends, there is some uh, discussion around uh, representation. Uh, we just wanted to mention, uh, and it's a bit of a, a, a shameless plug for Phil Fisher, um, uh, apologies. Uh, but Phil Fisher is a European law firm. Um, we can continue to advise and represent clients in EU matters, including before the EU IPO uh, and the EU courts. So our ability isn't compromised by Brexit. We have offices throughout uh, the EU and many of the lawyers uh, in our UK offices are also EU qualified and retain uh, full rights of representation. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, the end of the substantive part of the 
um, of the, the talks. Uh, we do have time for one um, question. And John, would you like to make your way up because it's being directed at you? Uh, <laughs> so uh, just while John makes his way up, what are the practical effects for trademark owners uh, on the current Court of Appeal decision in, in Skykick? Well, uh, that's a, a question a lot of people have been asking. I suppose the broad answer to that is the Skykick case, which um, will eventually adjudicate on the extent to which lack of intention to bad, lack, sorry, lack of intention to use bad faith will affect the validity of marks, is still an open question because the case hasn't received finality. Um, if Skykick obtain leave to appeal to the Supreme Court, there'll be at least another year wait until we know uh, what the learnings are about bad faith. For example, whether you can file trademarks that have 8,000 terms in them, very wide trademarks, or whether you can include terms that are very wide in themselves, like computer software. We won't know the answer to that until the Supreme Court um, adjudicates. If Skykick don't get leave to appeal to the Supreme Court, which professionally would be very disappointing for Phil Fisher, but then we will be basically stuck with the Court of Appeal decision as the final um, statement of the law. And that broadly says that certainly in relation to broad terms like computer software, there's nothing wrong in having them because uh, Skyke att attacked the breadth of the term computer software. Uh, and the Court of Appeal said that as long as you're using and have an intention to use computer software, for example, in Sky's case, set-top boxes, there's nothing wrong in having a huge term, very wide term, like computer software. What it does mean is that people who own those wide terms can sue people in connection with things that they have no legitimate business in. So Sky could sue somebody who has software in connection with air traffic control because they have a term that covers the software in air traffic control. So um, if, if there's no leave, then um, the current regime as set out by the Court of Appeal that broad terms are allowed uh, will remain. And that may come as some comfort to certainly brand owners who, who have wide terms. Um, what is interesting as an observation, sorry to go on so long, is that um, that could be called the UK view. Um, it's obviously a decision of the English Court of Appeal. If you look at the CJU decision in Skykick, that actually is slightly more damning of wide terms. In fact, the Advocate General's opinion thought that um, the behaviour of applying for very large wide terms like computer software ought to be um, decried and prevented on the basis of bad faith. So I guess, again, um, I'm afraid it's watched this space until we have a finality on, on the on the Skykit decision. I'm sorry to take such a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that's great, John, and thank you for the uh, thank you for the update. So I think we are um, finished there. Um, uh, thank you for everyone joining uh, joining us today at the Kramer. Uh, we hope you found it useful. Uh, our sessions are recorded and they will be available on the Phil Fisher YouTube channel post event. Uh, we will be sending a copy of the uh, slide deck along uh, with the feedback form as well. Uh, if your questions weren't answered, we only had time for one at the end. Uh, do get in touch with your usual contact or any one of us who would be happy to answer. Um, there is a lot of content that we put up through the Phil Fisher website, through our snippets blog. We're regularly commenting on case law and development, so do uh, tune in for that as well. Uh, do connect through socials, we're on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, and finally, a thank you to all of our speakers who I thought did really, really well, and a big thanks to our PSLs, Rebecca and Heidi, and along with our events and AV team. Uh, thanks again for attending, and we look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you back next year. Thanks, everyone.